Hello Seekers! Welcome to the first episode of a four-part series called Tarot 101 Learning Tarot for Beginners. In today's episode we will be discussing information like how to read a tarot card, how to read a tarot spread, and how to approach it. And then I will provide you with the meaning of all the major arcana 0 through 21. I have included a timestamp for each major arcana in the description below, you know, in case you would like to maybe fast forward to a particular a card. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you seekers to sign up to my Patreon. Uh, my dream is to be able to bring the magical message of spirit to others using the transformative power of the tarot. The best way that you seekers can help me do that is by signing up to my Patreon. Also, you will unlock many benefits like exclusive weekly uh, pick a card videos released every Saturday, any future behind the scenes footage, and also you'll have a chance to be entered into the monthly raffle for a free private reading with me. Thank you for your love and support, my beautiful future patrons. Again, the link is in the description below. Alrighty, Seekers, so let's go ahead and get started. So, using the tarot, all right? how do we use the tarot? What is tarot? Um, first off, tarot is really all about symbolism. Every card of the tarot is full of symbolism. Symbolism is the language of tarot, the way in, in which it communicates meaning, and the way in which we can engage with a card on a variety of levels. Anything can be a symbol, from an arcane ruin to a simple gesture, facial expression, or the weather. Symbols also do have one fixed meaning. They are designed to both evoke and invoke meaning for each reader. So their focus may shift over time or change based on the reading, uh, surrounding cards, inspiration, or influence from others. Now, an understanding of symbolism is one tool in your tarot toolbox that will help you give accurate readings. When a card invokes meaning, it draws upon traditional symbolic understanding that is often found in culture. Uh, symbolic systems, religion, you know, history. You know, that is the that is the, sim the the symbolism in these cards. Every single card is just filled with them. Now, when a card evokes meaning, it pulls out of the individual a personal response to the symbol based on experience, understanding, aesthetics, feelings, moments. A tarot reader can discover both the invoked and evoked meanings of a symbol and therefore a tarot card and recognizes both as equally important. Books on tarot and symbolism can often tell you some of the invoked meanings of various symbols that traditionally appear in cards. But one of your tasks as a reader is to discover new ways in which a symbol presents itself, new dimensions of meaning. So. How to read a tarot card. How to read a tarot card. When, when you're studying a card, ask yourself what symbols are present in it. There can, you know, they, they can include colors, for example. Uh, so we'll take a look at the full here. You know, when you're studying a card, you have to ask yourself uh, what are, you know, what, what symbols are present, right? That's the first thing. Uh, these can include colors, animals, activity, mood atmosphere, objects, nature, the age of people, the gender of people, weather, and natural occurrences. Allow the symbolism to come alive in your mind so that it might stimulate your knowledge and intuition. A tarot card might say something different to you each time you look at it. So try to remove all preconceptions when you examine the card. Some useful ways of approaching a card uh, and you know include some important questions like what are your initial feelings about the card, right? What do these symbols mean to you evoke? Is there a theme in these symbols? What are your feelings about the card now that you have examined the symbolism? What symbols stand out for you? How do these symbols relate to each other? What do books say about the card meaning? And how does this card relate to symbolic systems, right? So very important to consider that. Now, so, you know, how to read a spread, right? A tarot spread can be any number of cards. Uh, the more cards you have in your spread, the more confusing and daunting it can seem. 
However, there are some things you can do to get a grip on the spread before you even begin to interpret the card. All right, so one thing I also want to talk about is overcoming the mind blank. Uh, many people experience a mind blank when they lay out cards initially. Uh, this is caused by doubt of your knowledge and ability and by fear of getting it wrong. It is important to let go of the fear and doubt as they can hold you back from giving a great reading. The mind blank is at the beginning of a reader can, can it can feel it can feed doubt, right? But it is actually a natural part of the tarot experience, right? As the fool tells us. Let's take a good look at this fool here, right? As the fool tells us, the greatest spiritual journey begins with a blank slate with a beginner's mind. Allow yourself to pause and be still in that moment of blankness. Allow yourself to let your mind relax, quiet in doubt, and let your eyes roam gently over the cards and their images. Breathe. Silence gestates wisdom as the High Priestess teaches us, right? High Priestess teaches us that silent, silence gestates wisdom. So. Allow yourself that opportunity. All right, so let's talk about, I guess, you know, type of cards and um, finding the keys and, and just approaching uh, the, the spread. Uh, to, this is a great way to utilize the, the moment of blankness, and, and it can be done with any spread. Um, it immediately gives you a sense of what the reading is about before you've begun to analyze the cards, their position, and their individual meanings, scanning the entire spread, take note of any of the following and ask yourself what is what what it means so for example is the majority of the spread major arcana or minor arcana so while you're doing your scan while you're scanning and looking and, and actively trying to really you know find that symbolism with the spread with the cards ask yourself right do i have more major arcana or more minor arcana if major arcana dominate it might suggest that this is an extremely important issue dealing with the big questions in life or that the influences upon the situation are out of the control of the questioner. Is there a lot of court cards? This might indicate several people being involved in a situation. Is there a predominance of a certain suit in the spread? If so, this can indicate the area of life that the spread is focusing on. You know, a majority of cups, for instance, might indicate a relationship. A majority of pentacles might suggest issues of work or money. Is the spread lacking a suit? This might indicate something missing from the questioner's life or the situation, perhaps something that is needed. For instance, a question about a university course that lacks swords cards might indicate a problem. Also, something else to consider are numbers. Do certain numbers repeat? You know, for example, lots of fives. If so, they may bring the numerological energies of that number to the spread. You know, a spread with a lot of fives may indicate a situation of disruption. A lot of tens might suggest that something is reaching completion. Uh, remember that the major arcana have numbers too. The magician will be grouped with the aces, the high priestess with the twos. For a major arcana numbered 11 and higher, add the two digits together. Like for example, justice would be uh, would be two, right? It would break down to two. Uh, so also consider gender. Is there a majority of male figures or male figures in the cards? A large number of male figures might indicate a situation in which the quarant needs to be active. A large number of female figures might indicate that they need to wait or turn inward for answers. Consider the colors. Is there a large swath of color in the spread or an overwhelming color? You know, traditional color symbolism can help you interpret what this might mean. Uh, so predominantly, for example, red would mean action, passion, drive. Uh, yellow would mean optimistic, uh, black, grays. Perhaps this is a reading dealing with sadness and grief, right? Um, are there patches of color? Areas of certain colors can indicate groupings of cards or link them to each other. So examining these aspects of a spread before you begin to interpret the individual cards can give you insight into the focus of the spread, the issues that are being raised, and the themes of the cards. It forms a solid foundation 
upon which to build the more detailed interpretation. Now, let's go ahead and examine each card one by one. I'm gonna give you a close-up of each card so we can examine it together. Today, we're gonna to be using the Tarot Apocalypses by Eric C. Dunn and Kim Huggins. I love this deck, so much symbolism, so much beauty with the artwork. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and examine each card one by one. Again, I'm gonna include the timestamps below to each card. If you wanna go ahead and fast forward to that card, you can do that. Uh, I recommend that you don't. Because the major arcana is, you know, it follows the journey of the fool, right? So that it's it's important for you to really just understand the full picture here. So let's go ahead and start. All right, seeker. So in front of you, you have the fool card zero. The and the, the fool is an abstract and seemingly paradoxical as the the final card of the major arcana of the world. Um, together, they each are a beginning as well as an end. So an instigation as well as a conclusion. As its name suggests, it is associated with foolish action. Yet its presence in the lofty major arcana and its Im imagery says otherwise. You know, this, this foolishness manifests as divine foolishness. It's a sacred drunkenness, a mad ecstasy. This unity with Godhead is also a form of self-annihilation in which the boundaries between I and not I are destroyed, leaving only the divine. This in itself becomes its own form of spiritual madness, as the mystic acts contrary to social convention, seeming crazy to those who do not understand. And so, you know, the revelation of the fool is essentially the, the death of the ego boundaries and self. It's removing that which holds one back. It's spiritual ecstasy and drunkenness. It's unity. It's a feeling of oneness. It's divine inspiration. It's ad revelation. Um, it, it appears foolish to others as a mark of spiritual awareness. It's a new beginnings, right? The start of a new path or journey, new awakenings and realizations. It's the beginner's mind. As you can see here, the fool is just dancing, filled with this energy of excitement and joy for what is ahead. Um, there is a sense of rack, reckless abandonment with this fool. Now, there is a negatively aspected meaning to this, right? So we can, if the fool comes out reversed, it would indicate something else. So the full reversed is a foolish behavior. It's being unprepared to begin something new. It's it's na 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 uh, it's being naive essentially. Re it's reckless. Um, it's a sense of reckless abandon, uh, but reckless abandon for just not being able to see clearly and, and and being in that moment. It's it's dangerous spiritual practices. It's losing sight of the self and the goal. It's destroying the self for the sake of destruction. It's feeling worthless. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on to the next card. Card number one, and possibly my favorite of the Major Arcana, is the Magician. Uh, this card is the first of the Major Arcana to be given a proper number. It just helps us move from the chaotic ecstasy and divine bliss of unity found in the Fool to forceful action and manifestation. The, the title of this card does not refer to stage magicians or you know a sleight of hand. However, this magician is creating change to occur in conformity with his will through the manipulation and control of the universe. His words create reality. He binds supernatural beings to his will and controls the divine forces he summons. The magician of the tarot is a figure utterly in control of his resources. Uh, the magician takes an active role in all things and has a strong influence on results and manifests the changes he desires through his single-minded focus, um, his will and direction of his energy. He lacks, he, I'm sorry, he acts as a conduit between heaven and earth. Just uh, being able to draw down divine energy and channeling it into the mundane world. He performs magic. Now, this is not only results magic to gain mundane results. It is also mysticism and magical practices that lead to an ascent towards the divine. Now, the revelation of the magician is 
an initial burst of energy at the beginning of a process. It's manifestation. It's a, a cause to change that, 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 that just occurs in conformity with the will. It's drawing energy from somewhere and channeling it into something. It's bringing the sacred to the mundane. It's magic. It's ritual. It's having power and control over one's resources, knowledge. It's playing an active role. It's a single-minded purpose. It's direction towards a goal. Now, the magician, if reversed, if negatively expected, we're talking about lack of control and power is the symbolism here being acted upon it, it's a lack of urgency and agency it's a weak will it's lack of energy it's a charlatan no 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 driving force it's power being used in the wrong direction all right so let's move on to the next card Card number two, the High Priestess. So, this High Priestess most embodies mystery. In many tarot decks, uh, she is seated before the veil that covers the door to the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Solomon. She is not only the veil that guards the mystery of the Holy of Holies, but also the initiation that must take place to make the seeker worthy to enter that most sacred temple and the secrecy that by necessity surrounds its content. So the revelation of the high priestess is silence and its generative power, its mystery, its gastating within mystery, its initiation, its potential within the untouched and untried, its needing to see beyond the veil, its something hidden, it's the occult, secrets and secrecy, it's the unspoken understanding, it's the oracles, it's the seers, it's intuition, listening to inner wisdom instead of received wisdom. It's channeling the divine. It's a powerful person representing non-traditional spiritual authority. It's a call to spirituality, knowing that the answer lies within. Now, if the high priestess is reversed, then it's negatively expected as talking too much, ignoring signs, not trusting one's intuition, relying too much on facts, choosing to remain ignorant, being kept in the dark, revealing truths, speaking about what one knows, refusal to see, it's difficulty remaining silent, it's breaking vows and promises of secrecy. All right, so let's move on to the next card. Card number three, the Empress. Another one of my favorite cards because this is my birth card. This is my birth card. So uh, let's talk about this Empress. It's uh, as one of the more archetypal cards of the tarot. The Empress is one of the biggest. You know, she represents parts of the human existence that that are so fundamental to us all that the road she walks, which she walks on, is long and wide. Thus. You know, the interpretations and the imagings of her are vast and as she is. So to some, she is a nymph, like a maiden. She's desirable. She's sensual. Uh, to others, she is the pregnant mother to be bearing within her all of creation. And the, the mother with a baby at her breast or, or a wife or a female ruler of her kingdom. Um, all of these presentations have in common her relations to other beings. Uh, to a lover, to a husband, a child, or her subjects. They rely on the union between them and the emotions that created. She is also deeply tied to femininity. She is not used in the tarot to signify women, but instead to signify the conception, gestation, and creation and nurturing of life. So, the powers of the Empress are found in the lives of people of all genders and sexualities. So let's go ahead and talk about the revelation. So what does the Empress reveal? 
The Emperor's revelation is love, sensuality, beauty, sexuality, a lover, uh, active creation, the great goddess, femininity, the waiting womb, motherhood in the literal and metaphorical sense, nurture and care for others and the self, uh, growth and fertility, seeing projects grow, the creative process, artistry, giving everything to a creative goal, birthing something, uniting creativity and beauty, giving life to something, sweetness, joy in love and relationships, bounty, embodying love and compassion. All right, now, if you are to get the, the Empress reversed, okay, then we would have the, uh, you know, if this card is negatively inspected, then what we have is a smothering mother, neglecting to care for the self, being a martyr to the needs of others, creative projects that are blocked or progressing too slowly. It's a lack of creativity. It's difficulty finding beauty in self or others. It's infertility in a literal or metaphorical sense. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to the next card. Card number four, the Emperor. Now, just as the mother goddess of love appears in the tarot among the first cards of the major arcana to remind us of her primacy in the world, so too does the god of war come, following his queen, the prime image not only of a warrior, but of a father and a king. He is dominion, power, authority, and rulership with his strength. He both protects that which he rules and destroys that, which unfortunately will bring harm. As a king, he is ambition and the will to power, and he represents in each of us our aggressive, active nature that might be directed towards our goals. Without this emperor, we have no construct, no structure, or drive. Now, the revelation of the emperor is authority and power. It's being in a respected position. It's being in a position to have influence over others. It's dominion, rulership, owning one's power. It's a typically masculine trait. Um, aggression as a means to an end. It's an active approach to a situation. It's ambition and goals. It's parenthood, specifically fatherhood. It's a declaration of ownership, rulership or power and responsibility. Now, this card is reversed. It's negatively aspected. Then we can expect conflict or conflict for conflict's sake or to undermine the power, uh, authority or dominion of another. It's refusing to take responsibility. It's feeling uncomfortable in a position of influence. It's hiding from one's duties. Power used for unscrupulous ends. It's a destructive influence. All right, so let's move on to the next card. Here we have card number five, the Hierophant. Now, all seekers need a teacher. It is through a teacher that the mysteries are revealed, guidance given, and the established wisdom of the ages passed on to the newest person to walk that path. The teacher does not always take the form of a person. It may also be private research, a nature, or a sacred text, for instance. Through the established wisdom given to us, we learn what does and does not work, what is beneficial and harmful, hopefully avoiding the mistakes of history. As such, the Hierophant not only represents a teacher or a guide, somebody to whom we listen as a source of wisdom, but all forms of established wisdom, it's books, sacred texts, conventions, societal mores and values, traditions and history. It represents the body of knowledge available to us. To some, established knowledge and tradition are restrictive, 
However, when even however, even the newest ideas cannot be born without a foundation of what has gone before. So the hero font also represents the process by which the sacred is revealed, the act of teaching and guiding. The revelation of the hero font is spiritual dedication. It's religious service, dedication to a monastic life or a spiritual practice. It's discipline. It's uh, regimenting one's spiritual life to encourage discipline. It's a teacher or guide. It's uh, seeking a teacher, learning from somebody with experience. It's mediation, traditional and established spiritual practices or religions. It's uh, just the ritual. It's, it's faith. It's manifesting the sacred in one's everyday life. It's learning from established wisdom. Now, if this hero font is reversed, if it's negatively expected, then we can expect for this card to essentially be talking about traditions and customs being held back, uh, devotion through fear, it's being trapped in a material mindset, uh, it's needing advice but finding nobody willing to help, it's a lack of faith or loyalty, it's a teacher or figure of authority using their power poorly. All right, so let's move on to the next card. Card number six, the lovers. The lovers is the mystical and magical universe functions on the basis of duality. Um, it does not require that the universe of the divine be dual in nature. Instead, the duality of our world, creation and destruction, masculine and feminine, active and passive, mundane and divine is created from unity. The lover's card tells us that once all was one, but in order for manifestation to occur, it must become two, equal but opposite. One was divided for the sake of creation, and that creation now yearns passionately for reunion with its origins. As the name of the card suggests, this is a card of love, but it does not explore only the relationship between people. Rather, it shows the relationship between the divine and the mundane, man and God, the masculine and the feminine within each person between opposite parts of the self as they strive for union with their complement. This relationship has had a profound expression in many different religions and spiritual traditions, so it is fitting that the card image encompasses all of them. Primarily, the symbolism of the card is that of masculine and feminine, red and white, mundane, divine, although here here, a male figure is used to represent typically masculine traits and a female figure typically female traits. This too is only a symbol. It does not reflect a notion of gender roles. We are all both male and female figures. This becomes even clearer when we examine the alchemical symbolism in the card image. So the revelation of the lovers is love positive relationships of all kinds, partnership, duality, opposites coming together to one end, uniting two different aspects of something. It's drawing things together. It's union and reunion. It's marriage. It's spiritual oneness. It's spiritual marriage. It's the acknowledgement of the divine in another, complementary forces. Now, if we are to negatively if you were to get this card reversed and have it negatively expected, then the, the, this would be the absence. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. It's a separation as an excuse for sweet reunion. It's a relationship in difficulty, a, a need for separation. It's unrequited love. It's difficulty reconciling two different parts of one's self, or I'm sorry, one's life. So let's go ahead and move on to the next card. Card number seven, the chariot. This is the imperial cult uh, in which a ruler became deified and offerings given to his genius spirit. 
Um, this is a reminder of the ability of human beings to become divine. You know, it is this quest for divinity and immortality through godhood that is represented by the chariot. For it is the ultimate quest. It found manifestation not only in the imperial cult of Rome, but also in the hero cult of ancient Greece. Through these cults, the rulers of empires and men and women who performed great deeds were immortalized by their people and those who came after, uh, given cult and petition as gods. The chariot represents a journey and quest, but is also concerned with their triumphs, achievements, and reputation. Thus, while the quest of this card can be a spiritual one, it can also be the quest for remembrance long after we have gone, a quest for greatness. So, the revelation of the chariot is victory, its success, achievement, ambition, a journey of quests, the road to discovery or greatness, swift movement, progress towards a goal, Everything is part of the plan towards achievement. It's achieving greatness, right? It's astounding deeds. It's reputation and renown. It's a spiritual journey towards the divine. Now, this card was to come out reversed. Then we can essentially interpret that as slow progress or blocked progress. A journey without a goal. An uncertain path. Failure, not achieving something desired. Okay, so let's move on to the next major arcana. Number eight, strength. Following on from the victorious, fast-moving chariot, strength continues the theme of power and overcoming. However, where the charioteer drove the beasts that pulled his chariot, here, the beast is the chariot, demonstrating a more intimate connection between the rider and her raw, ferocious power. Strength seeks a way to become one with the wild, primal force, channeling it to a purpose. Here is the card of warriors and the empowered of the overcoming of a baser instincts and that which holds us back. The revelation of this strength card is true strength and inner strength, outward and inner strength. It's inner resources, it's power and it's manifestation towards a goal. It's wildness and ferocity. It's fighting for something. It's striving and overcoming. It's learning to channel one's raw power and energy. It's identifying one's strength. It's a process of gaining mastery over the self, taming the dangerous aspects of oneself. Now, if you were to get this card reversed, then we're talking of, or you know, we can interpret this as weakness weakness and fear, not being able to understand or identify one's power and strength. It's giving in and giving up, being controlled by one's weaknesses and fears, allowing one's inner demons to take over. All right, so let's move on to the next major arcana. Number nine, the hermit. Beneath the heavenly light show of the northern lights, surrounded by the stark beauty of the Arctic, an Angakok, Inuit shaman, drums to call forth the spirits of the land and her helping spirits. She has undergone a great many terrible trials, including her own death, to gain the wisdom that she uses to serve her community. Although she remains other, she is intimately linked to her community and serves it with all her power and spiritual wisdom. In the darkest of times, she is the last resort, shining a light to bring her people back from the darkness. The hermit, as suggested by her name, may withdraw herself from society or community in order to, ensuing the silence, 
find a greater understanding of the other. Whether that is the spirit world, the soul, nature, or inner processes of spiritual transformation. However, it is vitally important for the hermit to return to her people, bringing them the gift of her wisdom and spiritual power. So, the revelation of the hermit is guidance. Guidance from a spiritual source. It's seeking spiritual insight or wisdom. It's going within and reflecting to gain answers. It's being a guide for others. It's illumination in the darkness. It's going through a time of difficulty or darkness in order to achieve greater understanding. It's helping others with one's knowledge. It's the seeds of wisdom. It's introversion. It's meditation. Now, if you were to draw this card reversed, then we can, be, we can essentially interpret this as a feeling of isolation from others, uh, being unable to find answers, feeling blind and ignorant in a situation, ignoring a spiritual calling, or refusing guidance. All right, so let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 10, the wheel. The wheel shows us the truth of all things. Surrounded by nature, that ever-present reminder of the cyclical way of the world, the force of change is displayed as a four-spoked wheel with the seasons within it. Demeter, as the Greek goddess of agriculture, watches over the seasonal changes of the earth and the changes that humans undergo throughout, her, throughout their lives, both mundane and spiritual. So the revelation of the wheel is changes, you know, change as the only constant in the universe. It's the cyclical nature of life. It's what goes around, comes around. It's consequences. It's turning of the seasons. It's a change for the better. It's being at the center of an ever-changing situation. It's consciously creating change in one's life. Now, if you were to draw this card reversed, then we can interpret this as uncertainty caused by a great deal of change. Change needed, but blocked or delayed. It's an unwillingness to accept change. It's change for the worse, or change being forced. Number 11, Justice. The title of this card initially suggests notions of human justice, of judgment in a court of law, uh, retribution, reward and punishment. It carries with it an inherently moralistic tone. Tarot cards, however, always work on more than one level. In the justice card, the human codes of law and moral behavior reflect a higher order the laws of nature and balance. However, like the scales that form the main symbol of this card, this balance is not static. It is a continual process of subtle shifts and changes. Balance does not mean equality, but an act of changing in response to necessity to maintain order. Along with this notion of cosmic order and balance comes the concept of rightness, not in the sense of being morally acceptable, but in the sense of being in line with the balance of the universe. So the revelation of this justice card is essentially balance and equilibrium. It's maintaining order, it's rightness, it's truth and honesty, it's positive dealings with the law and justice. It's the laws of nature, it's cosmic order, it's the notions of reward, it's fairness, it's staying on the straight and narrow path, aligning oneself with a sense of purpose and cosmic order. Now, if you are to draw this card reversed, then we can interpret that as unfairness and imbalance, falsehood, negative dealings with the law and justice, notions of punishment, and deviance. 
So let's go ahead and move on to the next major arcana. Card number 12, The Hanged Man. Now, two of the themes found commonly in the mystical and religious traditions of all cultures are represented by the hangman, sacrifice and the dark night of the soul. It is through sacrifice that we might come to understand worth. It is by undergoing the suffering and pain of spiritual anguish and isolation that we grow closer to the sacred. In the hangman, the self is sacrificed to a higher power. We let go of control and give in to that power. We come to understand that when it seems we have been abandoned by the gods, we are instead growing closer, closer to them. Here at the point between the midnight of the soul and the dawn of the gods, a young man from one of the plains nations of North America offers his blood and self in sacrifice, enduring the exhausting mortification of the sun dance. So the revelation of the hangman is essentially sacrifice and offering, learning what one values by being forced to give something up, letting go and giving in to a higher power. It's suspension of activity. It's a dark night of the soul. It's achieving mystical awareness through spiritual isolation or suffering. It's a time of difficulty and an ordeal resulting in increased understanding. It's seeing things from a different perspective. Now, if you were to draw a hangman reversed, then we can interpret that as being unwilling to give something up or make a sacrifice, detrimental isolation, uh, being unable to see one's way through suffering, uh, being forced into an ordeal unwillingly. It's the world being turned quite literally upside down. All right, let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 13, death. Death is a certainty. It is unavoidable and unknowable, feared by many above all things. In our time, we experience not only our own death, but the deaths of loved ones, acquaintances, and people we did not know but who were tied to us through commonality of language, culture, country, or religion. Death is so much a part of every person's life and the life of everything in our universe that it is no surprise to see it in the major arcana of the tarot. Here, it represents transformation at its most foundational or for even in death, nothing is destroyed. It, it just changes form. It represents both the physical death of the body and the metaphorical death that we experience throughout life. It is at once beautiful and terrifying, unifying for it is something we all have in common and deeply isolating for we are alone in our experience of our own death. It is no wonder that humankind's relationship with death is so conflicted and confused. Many cultures demonstrate the conflicted relationship with death by depicting it as both frightening and beautiful. And the Mexican cult of Santa Muerte, Holy Death, is a perfect example of this. So, the revelation of this death card is natural endings. It's progression towards a conclusion. It's bringing something to a close. It's transformation. It's metaphorical death. It's letting go of a loved one. It's harvest. It's a reaping of results. It's considerations of mortality. It's change that must be accepted. It's a change of state. It's a metamorphosis. It's one door closing and another opening. Now, if you were to draw the death card reversed, then we can interpret that as a refusal to accept change, 
stagnation, failing to reap a harvest through refusal to acknowledge an ending. It's fear of change. It's unwanted change. It's issues of mortality causing pain and suffering. All right, let's move on to the next major arcana. Number 14, temperance. Temperance appears like a, a moment of relief in a run of dark major arcana cards. It's the the begin you know it's the beginnings with the hangman and ending with the tower. Now, even though its outward appearance is one of beauty, it is as difficult and challenging as its companions. Here, we are charged to reunite that which we have separated and been taken apart in the process of the journey. What began in the lovers with the marriage of the Sun King and the Moon Queen now takes a place on a deeper level. No longer are the two in union, for now they are truly one, an entirely new part of creation that is greater than the sum of its parts. The sacred marriage bears its fruit, and a continued, careful process of transmutation begins, during which the soul will continue to ascend. The card image portrays the mysteries of temperance as the art of alchemy, though it bears mundane mysteries also. Here is the, the art of blending different aspects of something to create something better, of manipulating the resources we have in a process of creation, of tempering our activities to ensure that through moderation we are productive. You know, the name of this card um, does not adequately, uh, adequately convey the depth of the mystery that it holds, I feel. You know, conjuring up images of quiet virtue and timidity, the title seems to ignore the mystical transformation of the soul that takes place herein. The process by which the base matter of the self can be transmuted into spiritual gold. However, temperance is the virtue most apt for the art form of the alchemical process. This process separates the quintessence, perfect spirit, from the unrefined base earth, the subtle form from the dense, gently with unremitting care. This is a gentle art performed with prudence and temperance. The revelation of temperance is moderation. It's not taking things to extremes. It's tempering one's actions and those of others. It's gentleness and carefulness. It's undertaking a long process of transformation. It's blending many eclectic influences to create something. Something that is greater than the sum of its parts. The first result being born from a process of spiritual transformation. Spiritual transformation being caused through mundane action. Now, if you were to draw this card reversed, then we can interpret that as treating eclectic influences separately, uh, separation, being immoderate and intemperate, rushing, going to extremes, spiritual transformation blocked by mundane activity. Let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 15, the devil. As its name suggests, the devil is a complex card that is often feared and reviled, but which offers ways towards you know, spiritual realization as much as it offers warnings and temptations towards spiritual stagnation. Like the other dark cards of the tarot, it reminds us that the darkness is as much a part of illumination as the light, and here there are mysteries to be found also. These are the mysteries of the primal beast within, of expressing the animalistic and feral aspects of our personalities rather than repressing them, of learning the origins and nature of our fears so that they might not control us and be projected onto others, of recognizing when we are our own worst enemy and when we are demonizing others 
for our faults. The revelation of the devil is accepting the wild, animalistic aspect of the self and life. It's the processing of fears and inner demons in a healthy manner. It's uh, experiencing lust and desire. It's uh, being bound to something one wishes to. It's something sexual in nature. It's flouting authority in a form of challenge. Now, if we are to flip this card reversed, if you are to draw this card reversed, we can interpret it as demonizing others, scapegoating, projecting one's fears onto others or a situation, not seeing the reality of a situation. It's something feeling unnatural. It's being bound to something unwanted. It's harming others through distrust, uh, manipulation, or guilt. It's sexual feelings and desires repressed and unprocessed. All right, let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 16, the tower. The tower is often seen as one of the most terrifying cards of the tarot. It shows us a painful process of destruction and the world changing. Lightning strikes simultaneously illuminating us and causing our world to crumble. What we hold most dear, sacred and true is consumed by fierce and unstoppable fire. Even the most fundamental things upon which we have built our lives crumble to dust. It is in this moment of utter devastation that we are liberated and given no thing and no self as a firm foundation upon which to build a new life. We walk now in the great cremation ground, surrounded forever by the consuming fire that renders to ash the illusion of attachment, and with it all our fears and weaknesses. Many people experience the sudden devastation of the tower without conscious decision when external events influence our internal processes. Now, the revelation of this tower is destruction, devastation, sudden change, its painful realization, external forces acting upon a person to force them to change turning life upside down. It's a need to reevaluate. It's everything being taken away. It's a breakdown, to destruction of the ego. It's liberation from what held the person back. It's a release. It's a freedom from fear through immersion in it. It's breaking down constructs that limit us. It's crisis. It's the house build upon sand. Now, if you were to draw this card reversed, then we can interpret that as refusing to let change happen, being unable to recover from a crisis, clinging to constructs despite them falling away, not cutting losses when you should. It's the captain staying on the sinking ship. Let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 17, the star. In the Terror Apocalypse, uh, we have here a representation of Mother Mary as the star. This is Our Lady, the star of the sea, also known as Stella Maris. As Stella Maris, Mary is the sign of hope and guidance for those lost in the darkness. She provides mercy to those lost on the metaphorical seas of life's uh, troubles and brings them safely to shore. Like the star of the tarot, which comes directly after the terror and destruction of the tower, she heals and soothes, offering renewal and peace. The revelation of the star is hope, light in the darkness, guidance in times of trouble, refreshment, renewal, rejuvenation, blessings being given, unexpected good fortune, a time of healing, 
spiritual guidance. It's, you know, finding one's path after confusion. It's being able to return to the world after seclusion. It's nourishing one's spiritual self and path. It's uniting the spiritual and material worlds. It's allowing the spiritual to inform the everyday world. A guiding star, it's intercession, it's being pulled away from danger, it's mercy, it's grace, it's salvation. Now, if you are to draw the star reversed, then we can interpret that as ignoring offers of help and healing. Refusing to see the hope in the darkness, giving up hope, being lost, difficulties, reconciling one's spiritual life with one's everyday life, separation of spiritual and material world, request for help refused. Let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 18. The moon, a card of flux, shadows, magic, and feminine mysteries. The moon shows us the dark roads of the subconscious, the half-dreamed, and the almost nightmarish. At night, by only the light of the moon, the familiar becomes strange and the way uncertain. By the light of the moon, we might catch enough light to be guided through the darkness. Secret trias are made, and the nefarious beings of the night emerge. It is here, at the liminal crossroads, that we might participate in the secret rites of Hecate. So, the revelation of the moon is otherness. It's essentially the feminine mysteries. And as the moon, you know, we have here Hecate as the uh, multitude of faces that shift from one to another as easily as the moon changes in the sky. She rules over the shadowy and liminal parts of the earth, uh, lights the way on the dangerous roads, uh, guides us through the mysteries, uh, teaches us her secrets, uh, terrifies and protects as well. She bears the keys to the mysteries, opening up the way before us that we might enter the realms of the otherness and darkness. And um, essentially, you know, that the revelation of this moon is also the key to a mystery. It's the unknown, it's the subconscious, it's magic, it's the scent, is investigating the taboo or danger, it's, uh, or, or dangers. And, and it's also female biology. Now, if you are to draw this card reversed, then we can interpret that as secrets being kept maliciously, not being able to trust a person, danger in unknown places, risks as a result of a new path, refusal to adapt to change, difficulties with aspects of the feminine, and madness as well. All right, let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 19, the sun. The sun may convey small mysteries of the everyday world, but also the deeper mysteries of the soul, initiation, revelation, and illumination. While every major arcana card initiates the reader into a mystery, the sun represents the moment in which illumination occurs when mystery is revealed. It is the awe-inspiring, wondrous realization that is initiation's aim, which was physically represented in many mystery initiations in the Greco-Roman world by an unveiling and revealing of the cult icon. This icon was often an image of the god to whom the cult was dedicated, but may also have been an item that was symbolic of the mystery being conveyed. So, the revelation of the sun is essentially illumination. 
It's revelation. It's truth being revealed. It's the harsh light of day. It's realization. It's achieving a great understanding. It's the natural state of the soul as one of illumination. It's liberation from illusion. It's rising above the shadows. It's speaking truth to others. It's showing others the right way. It's happiness, bliss, celebration, victory, a time of growth. It's improvement and movement forwards. It's a burning desire for truth. Now, if you are to draw this card reversed, then we can interpret that as delayed improvement seeking illumination in the wrong place, painful realizations, and a truth that hurts. Let's move on to the next major arcana. Card number 20, Judgment. It is not always through mystical practices and initiations into mystery religions that we achieve revelation and spiritual evolution. Mythology plays a vital role in our spiritual landscape, often acting as the foundation upon which the mysteries of initiation are founded. Mythology is the language through which a mystery is revealed and experienced. It links our human endeavors and experiences with those of the gods, heroes and ancestors, creating a timeless thread between the past present, and the future. In the Judgment card, we show not a mystery religion or mystical practice, but an almost universal myth, a motif of spiritual evolution and rebirth, the Great Flood. Judgment represents a fundamental experience of human life, evolution, and rebirth. It is so vital for our spiritual health that no single mystical practice or mystery religion could illustrate it. Every initiation, every revelation is a process of rebirth. The soul is reborn out of darkness, out of a state of death and inertia. In alchemical terms, it rises out of its state as a base metal and is transmuted into gold. In the card image, the people in the lowest part of the card are white, their skin corpse pale. Some are actually dead, their bodies dashed against rocks by the great waves. Those who have pulled themselves from the waters are pink skinned, alive and rising. Those at the pinnacle of the card taking the final leap off the foundation of earth towards the glowing heavens are golden like the philosopher's stone. The great flood myth is, is found in large numbers of cultures, the most familiar to the Western world being that of the Old Testament in which God sent a flood to wipe out mankind, which had become wicked. In this story, one man whose heart is not wicked and his family survived the flood, saving a pair of each animal and repopulating the earth. In the same book, the world and all creatures were created out of the chaotic waters, raising parallels between the waters of origin and the waters of rebirth. In the judgment card, it is from a state of darkness and origin that re we are reborn so we might rise above it. So the revelation of judgment is essentially an experience or process of rebirth. It's rising above, climbing out of a state of chaos or inertia, finding one's purpose, having a calling, the call to the spiritual life, gaining increased awareness, a heightened sense of understanding, transformation, it's pulling oneself out of a base and uncontrollable situation. It's morality and a sense of what is right. It's achieving freedom. It's listening to the higher self. It's serving one's higher needs. 
It's purging that which is holding one back. Now, if you are to draw this card reversed, then we can interpret that as a refusal to accept a calling, being trapped or chained down by a person, a situation, or outlook, feelings of going backwards, regression, a morality, bad choice, it's ignorance, it's being kept in the dark. Let's go ahead and move on to the next major arcana. Number 21, the world. I am a big fan of the world. This is actually my birth card. One of my birth cards. The Empress and the world are both uh, my birth cards. So, you know, at the end of the major arcana, we are given the world. It, it shares with the fool the paradoxical nature of first and last, beginning and ending. For it is the goal attained at the end of the journey, the cause of the journey, and the process by which it is traveled. As with many of the higher cards of the Major Arcana, its spiritual applications seem more natural than its mundane meanings. At its simplest, the world represents the wisdom that has been gained over the long journey to attainment. Here, it is shown in the form of Sophia, the divine feminine of Valencian Gnosticism. Now, the revelation of the world is completion. It's the culmination and conclusion. It's high, high, high achievement. It's victory and triumph in attainment. It's reaching the end of a journey, synthesis of all that has been learned, it's gaining wisdom through experience. It's breaking through to a new stage of one's journey. It's claiming one's sacred birthright and inheritance, realizing one's place in the universe, realizing the sacred and divine in the self. Now, if this card were to be drawn reversed, then we can interpret that as delayed attainment, a journey of struggle, feeling trapped in one's life or body, a hint of something greater than one's current situation, or being afraid to move on. All right, Seekers, so that brings us to the very end of the first episode of this four-part series called Tarot 101 for Beginners. Um, so I'm, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked it. Um, I, I definitely, um, you know, put a lot of work into it. So I'm hopeful that you were able to learn uh, a bit more about the tarot. Um, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to give this video a like, uh, like, 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 so we can help the algorithm and join me on Patreon. Uh, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day or night, wherever they are. Bye-bye.